Boom. All right. So in this video, we're going to demonstrate how to do the NIH, NIH stroke scale. I just finished the shift and I cannot talk anymore. So. I'm uh, in uh, mine. You're getting close to it. All right, and then we have a student here who's very willingly volunteered to do it. He's okay being on YouTube. And so, Hartman, why, so, are, you, why are you qualified? What makes you qualified to teach us about this um, NIH stroke scale? Well, I don't know about the qualifications for teaching. However, I do have to do the uh, NIH stroke score testing uh, every two years to maintain my certification to be able to do uh, TPA administration via our telemedicine network. So since I'm doing this all the time anyway, I can zip through it fairly fast. Uh, even on, on the telemedicine system with a helper on the distant end who may or may not be well versed in it, it usually it takes me less than five minutes to run through the NIH stroke score. Okay, uh, and, and you're right shift. in the middle of a busy shift, so I, but I borrowed you, so we'll, we'll make this fast. We'll, we'll probably make it just about like I do it in real life. Okay. So uh, we've got this 60 year old woman here. Uh, if you'll lay back on the stretcher and uh, if you want, you can have some facial droop and a dance on your it, it doesn't matter. We'll put you up here in a nice, comfortable little so Dr. Malik can video. Uh, so uh, just rest your head on back and be, be relaxed. Uh, so we're going to run through the elements of the NX stroke score. So I like starting at the head. That way I can, take, when I'm doing the telemedicine thing, I can kind of zoom in after I've kind of done a quick assessment just to see what's going on. So the first thing I like to do is just look for facial asymmetry and just see if there's any weakness in the nasolabial fold, perhaps, if there's blunting there or uh, that it's uh, not as prominent. Uh, if I don't see that, or regardless of whether I see it, then I ask the patient to smile real big. Show me a big toothy smile, please. Great. That's wonderful. You can relax that. Uh, close your eyes tightly for me. And here, I'm just watching for facial symmetry. You can relax that. Okay. Now, I get my helper uh, to either have them follow up with my finger or I ask the patient, uh, turn your, hold your head still and turn your eyes to the left for me and turn your eyes to the right and I can do all this on the telemedicine system zooming right in and you relax, relax that again. At this point I do like to have my, my helper help me with the uh, uh, visual, confrontational visual fields and just like you are poised there with your camera a lot of times I have my helper prompt to do this and I can't see anything. Mm -hmm. So either I have them come around or come from the top of the head of the bed. So okay. tell me when you can see fingers wiggling on either side. And pointing is actually a very good way of doing it, especially if you have an aphasic patient. Uh, and now for the, for the quadrants, just keep looking straight ahead. And which side do you see? Point, when you see it? I'm, I'm okay. Right, okay. We'll have to check both sides for that phenomenon of extinction. We'll see some of the sensory component of extinction as well. Sometimes there's too much input and the brain can only process one side at a time. That causes okay. problems. So, uh, so we've done uh, facial symmetry, we've done uh, uh, eye movement, and we've done visual fields. So we can move on. So hold both your arms straight out in front of you like you're doing a zombie walk. Uh, sometimes folks will do it one arm at a time. I, I'd like to cheat sometimes uh, and to have both sides done. And this is for 10 counts, so it's like, no, don't rush through it. So. 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, we're probably actually about 6, 1,000, 7, 1,000, 8, 1,000, 9, 1,000, 10, 1,000. Great, you can put your arms down. Now pick up each leg one at a time. Hold it up for a five count. 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000, 5, 1,000. And you get the idea with the other leg, they hold it up for a five count. Usually while I'm down at the legs at that point, I'll go ahead and switch to go ahead and check in for ataxia. So what we'll do is the heel to shin. So if you'll bend this leg up for me, uh, put it on your, on your knee and slide it down the front of your shin in a nice neat line. Rubber soled shoes always make this a little difficult. Come back up again. Do like you're scratching your leg. Go ahead and I switch legs. So that's just heel to shin. Great. You can put that back down again. And then we'll do the equivalent for the upper extremities. If you'll take your finger and touch your nose. And now touch my finger and go back and forth between the two as best as you can. And I like making this a moving target, which also helps me confirm my visual field. Switch hands, please. We're just looking for a nice smoothness. Great, so depth perception is there as well. Uh, so next we'll do sensory uh, perception. So if you'll close your eyes and you can either point or tell me left or right. So, and do they feel the same? They do. Okay, so it's left, right, and both, and do they feel the same? The same as the extinction parts. Again, simultaneous stimuli, if the patient has the extinction phenomenon, they'll only be able to tell you one side and it's consistent with just that one side. So, same thing here on the forearms. You feel, you're indicating to me left, right, and both, if they feel the same. And one more time down here in the legs, which side? 
Great. And do they feel the same? They do. Lovely. Um, so next we're going to do some stuff that there's some visual stimuli for in the NH stroke scale. I took the liberty of printing them out. So there are some pictures that I always ask for there at our remote site. So this is a picture you can see that what's, imagine what's going on. So I'm going to ask the patient to tell me what's going on. It does two things. I get to listen to, the, to their speech. I'm also checking to see if there's neglect because they may just see one side of the picture. As you can see, I think the picture's kind of divided. We have the woman washing the dishes over here with this water running over the sink. On the other side, we've got the kids getting into the cookie jar and the stool's about to fall over. So you can take a look at that and repeat to me what I just told you that I... But she didn't told you what's on the picture. There's a woman washing dishes at the sink and children on a stool that's about to fall over. Okay. What we don't want is our, our person trying to help and, and promote. Well, do you see anything going on over here on this side? Or what else do you see going on over here? The, the question is simply, tell me what you see going on. And you can hear that his speech is very good. We also have another uh, picture with some images on it. Uh, so this is just simply a matter of can they process you know the names of these objects and articulate those. So... Sometimes we can cheat on that a little bit if the patient's aphasic, we can still see if their language skills are otherwise intact. So tell me the names of these things. Glove, a key, cactus, chair, hammock. Okay. Now, if that didn't work, I might point to this and say, is that, is this a key? Is this a key? Is this a hammock? Is that a feather? Until um, they nod correctly. All right, so we have those things. By the way, in the South, a lot of people have trouble with the hammock. Uh, sometimes the feather gets interpreted as a leaf the glove gets interpreted as a hand, so you kind of have to anticipate uh, some of those not immediately uh, obvious answers. Oh, but I forgot to ask you, some of the first questions are simply, what month is it? April. Okay, and not, rather than age, what month is it, which, which you answer correctly, and how many years old are you? Not what is your birthday, but how old are you? 31. I think, and that, you got that one wrong because I said you were a 62-year-old woman. Oh. <laughs> All right, then we have some words. We want folks to articulate these very clearly for us. I don't know if that's on your screen. Uh -huh. So if you can go and read those. Mama, tip top, 50-50, thanks, Huckleberry, baseball player. And you can hear there's all kinds of diphthongs that are in there. So if someone has some slurred speech, you'll pick that up. Again, you have to watch out here in the South uh, for ethnic variability. So it's always nice when there's a reliable historian who can tell you, is this how they always sound? And pretty much if, you know, if the patient can't tell you what the onset was anyway, you're going to have to have those historians. And then just kind of looking, listening for the language. So if you can read those sentence fragments, I always warn folks, they don't make a whole lot of sense. Just plow through them. There's not a speed uh, or time limit on these things. Just take your time. But read them and just, just, you just kind of listen for the, for the intonation and the voice and stuff. You know how, down to earth, I got home from work near the table in the dining room. They heard him speak on the radio last night. And you can hear that his speech is very clear. So um, I think I've covered everything already. So we've basically got an NIH stroke score of zero here. So that's it. I don't know how long it took us, but I bet it was right out or slightly under five minutes. Yeah. Um, so what score would be worrisome? Uh, historically, four was kind of the magic number at that point where you gave TPA. But now folks are thinking a little bit more in terms of how much disability is there. So let's say that he lost his vision on the on his uh, right entire right visual field. So the right side of his world is missing. Um, this is a guy who oh, the left side. This is a guy who's going to step out of traffic and get hit by a car. That's profoundly disabling, I would argue. Uh, if he were a piano player and lost fine uh, motor function of his hand, it's not even on the NIH stroke score. You can do little things like having having the fingers marched off the thumb or the checking for dysdiadochokinesia. If there are disruptions there, and this is a person who depends on their hands for their livelihood, that's a significant stroke. It only may score one or two points or even zero. Um, this is a person I would be offering TPA to. I had a fellow that seemed like the exam was pretty normal. There was a little bit of subtle ataxia, but when I tried to stand him, he couldn't stand. This is a man who's normally walking and, and works uh, carrying things for a living. He'd be wiped out. He actually, on a CT scan, had a, a hyperdensine in one of his cerebellar arteries. So I treated him with TPA. He got better. So that's a good question then. What do you, how often do you see patients respond dramatically to the TPA or is it only partial? Uh, I mean, we, we know that not everybody responds and it's multifactorial. It depends on how long it was before they arrived. And uh, part of the counseling that you do for the family, you, I would tell them, don't expect the patient to hop up from the table and get better and click their heels and say, thanks, I needed that. 
Uh, it does happen occasionally, we do have that Lazarus effect, but the studies are all about how is the patient doing at 90 days. So don't expect miracles, even, it's just like any other injury, it's, it's injured brain and it's not gonna, you don't really expect full recovery. Having said that, um, some patients who you have TPA too, they have big, large vessel occlusions, if they haven't improved by four points within an hour or so, if you have the endovascular capability, then you move on to that process. So it really depends on what do you have available here at the Ivory Towers. We've got, you know, everything including the machine that goes boing, but for those who got that reference. Uh, but we can do that. If it's a little small hospital, then I can be able to do that. May, then maybe too far away to proceed on to the next step by the time that, that transfer occurs, it may be too late. But we're actually working uh, at the transport arrangements with all our rural hospitals and looking at the flight times to see if we, you know, anticipate it's going to take this long to get from way over there to here. Is there still enough time window? Do we activate the cath lab here to get that patient in? Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much. Appreciate it. This is Dr. Hartman Gross and um, basically professor of emergency medicine, professor of neurology, neurology. and uh, you're on the REACH uh, stroke team. Mm -hmm. and, uh, We've you been take doing that for 12 years now, and I've done you know, have to put that in the videotape. I've done like 600 consults, and I had 113 TPA administrations. Wow! I have to keep track because yeah. hospitals with low so, QOT or low activity, I have to report what my experience to maintain my credentials. Okay, fantastic. Um, there, what what are the risk of doing TPA? Depends on the severity of the stroke. So, unlike the stuff that keeps coming out that says, you know, the risk of, of, of bleeding from stroke uh, from TPA is six or seven percent, depending on who you're reading. That, that's kind of an all-comer. It's kind of like, you know, what are your chances of dying from a heart attack? Well, it depends on what area of, your, of the injury there is, which vessel is affected, how, how proximately is it occluded. It's not one, one um, So there are bleeds, there are bleeds, and then there are bleeds. There are bleeds, there are bleeds. Sometimes there are some microscopic hemor hemorrhages um, that, that are visible on CT scan, little micropunctate right. things of no clinical significance. The patients do fine, and they go on to their rehab rather than the nursing home. There are catastrophic bleeds. Those are fortunately very for, few and far in between. And if you stick closely to the guidelines, you don't really get, don't see those very often. Uh, even with large bleeds uh, or large strokes, that risk is not as bad as, as advertised. Uh, I'll qualify that. Mm -hmm. uh, for the low NIH stroke scores, let's say zero to three, your chance of bleeding is one, maybe up to one percent. Uh, again, you're treating some of these folks that have these low NIH stroke scores but have a significant deficit. Uh, you get into the uh, 10, uh, NIH stroke score of 10, your risk of hemorrhage is around um, 3 to 4 percent. At 20 though, it jumps on up uh, to about 20 percent risk of hemorrhage, which is a little worse than playing Russian roulette with the bullet and the revolver. Um, so this is only one bullet in five chambers rather than one in six chambers. Um, so when you have someone that profoundly uh, affected, I mean, they're wiped out. Dense hemiparesis, they're oblivious to what's going on in the world. They're basically in vegetative state and they're going to require custodial care. When you talk to the family members, it's like, we're stuck between a rock and a hard place. We got this stuff that is not going to make them well. Hopefully we can get them back a little bit, um, make, turn the severe stroke to a moderate stroke. Maybe they can help brush their teeth. Maybe they can help you know, comb their hair. Maybe they can just turn over in bed a little bit. But hopefully we get them to that point but they also have a very high risk of bleeding and it could kill them. Um, and my experience has been that all family members have decided that there are worse things than, than uh, dying uh, and stroke being left in that kind of position is that. Okay. So they would rather take the risk and say, mama would not like, like to be left like that. Let's, let's go for it, let's hurry and do it. And we've had some that we've pulled back dramatically from, from that severe stroke. Wow, very good. Well, thank you so much.